Wow, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the start of Pike Gotham here. Uh, my name is Evan Morikawa, and what are you doing? And, and by you, I mean you, my dear servers, my dear users, you, dear API, what, what are you doing? Uh, and for the API that I work on, uh, this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer, actually. Uh, so I work on APIs, on building APIs for email, calendar, and contacts. Basically all that means is that I can curl an email account and get a giant list of threads as JSON. Right? Here's all the email in my inbox, regardless if it's Gmail or Office 365 or Yahoo or IMAP. Um, and not just getting requests, I can make post requests as well. So here I'm going to post an email, I'm just send an email uh, from myself to myself from the uh, command line here. Right, so this is what I mean by like types of APIs that I work on to get, post, read, update, any event, any item you find in a mailbox, a calendar, or an address book. Um, so these are the APIs that I ask a lot of questions to all day long. Uh, and I do all of this through a startup called Nihilus. Uh, there are 41 of us now, largely based in San Francisco, although we very recently started up a new engineering office here uh, in New York and FIDI. Um, and uh, it is through this system that we have a lot of these APIs that uh, we can no longer, when asking what they're doing, just do a simple like tail. Uh, in the very beginning, when we build our APIs on top of Flask, and I'm just testing there, we're getting a couple requests in, it's very reasonable to just tail the logs or look at the logs and ask, what are you doing? Um, now that's fine if it's just one or two requests coming in, that's fine if you're prototyping. Uh, but the whole point of this talk is about what happens when that goes from what you can reasonably tail to when it comes in at 10 requests a second or 100 requests a second or 1,000 requests a second. Um, and then eventually get to a point where we're sort of a, we're about passing the point now where we get about a billion of these a week. Um, so there's no longer within reason that you can sort of tail a log uh, anymore. And we need to use different techniques to ask this question of what are you doing? Um, so there's a lot of ways to visualize traffic. Uh, but a billion requests a week is kind of an abstract concept. So I try to think of ways to sort of visualize what it means to get data at that volume. Uh, one kind of fun way to, to think about that here, uh, this is what 10 dots a second looks like coming in flashing away at you here. Um, and this is what 100 of them a second look like. This is what 1,000 a second looks like. Um, and we're, we're pushing around like 2,000 or so a second. Um, so when you think about like data coming in at you, like this is sort of the rate you need to start making sense of uh, stuff that you have here. Uh, another way to think about it is uh, auditorily. Uh, so what is like 10 beats a second sound like? What does 100 beats a second sound like? What does 1,000 beats a second sound like? Uh, and the answer is it sounds something like this. That's about 10. That's 100. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, Okay, so that's, that's like one kind of interesting way to think about like a volume or flood of data. Uh, here's what 20, for fun, here's what 20,000 a second looks like. Um, so you'll need to get better and better ways to start processing some of this data. Uh, which, which sort of brings me to uh, what really we sort of focused on here today is making sense of all of that at these types of scales and so sort of logging and monitoring techniques uh, that we can use to make that happen. Uh, so really at the end of the day, when I'm looking at our API, when we're thinking about our Flask systems, I kind of at the end of the day, I have four big questions in layman's terms that I want to ask, right? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> How is it going? Is it working? And if it's not, why is it broken? Um, these are pretty fundamental questions to ask. Um, they're pretty like intuitive to get at uh, and sort of like how do we pick apart and what are some good tools and techniques to use to get at answers for this? Um, in the observability and sort of back-end worlds, these have more sophisticated aims from uh, your success rate monitoring, to your API performance, and all these other things. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, this is all I care about uh, to start off with. Um, so I'm gonna first start by this simple question of like, what is it doing at that scale? 
Um, there are actually quite a few different techniques that are out there to do, uh, to figure this out with. Uh, but the one I'm going to talk about today is this tool we use called Honeycomb, uh, which basically just lets you graph all of the data that's coming in over the past, say, two hours, or let's pull this back out to the past week or so. Um, and you see out of this data, I got about like in the past 874 million data points coming in over the past like amount of time. Uh, the ability to not only look at this data, but slice and dice it by different dimensions and sort of dig into stuff and do that quickly is very important to start to ask this question of what are you doing? Because normally you're only asking this uh, when probably something's going wrong. Uh, so actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to like add one extra dimension on this. So we have a whole bunch of these API endpoints. We have ones for threads, ones for calendar events, ones for contacts. I'm going to break it down by endpoint. Um, I'm going to make sure it exists. I'm going to filter out uh, some things like the health endpoint, which we don't care about right now, and this other delta one that we don't care about right now, um, and ask it again, uh, how is it doing this across like a variety of different endpoints here? Um, so here you can see traffic now broken up. Here's a bunch of messages and updating events and looking those up and things like that too. Um, and I can you can pull that into a little bit of a shorter time frame here as well. Uh, so this is starting to get at this question of like what are people doing with our API, right? There's like obviously requesting a bunch of email messages, which makes sense for uh, an email API. Uh, but then there are like, but then we can also ask questions like what is this like giant spike here? Uh, so let's zoom in on that spike and see what is going on here. And we see, ah, oh, that's like somebody querying a lot of events suddenly. That's weird. So let's focus in on just where those events are. Um, and now we sort of back to another, whenever we sort of end up in a graph like this, I ask myself, well, is there any more information I can get out of this? What other dimensions can we have here? Um, in this case, I know I have a hunch that, oh, maybe like one of our customers decided to just hammer this really hard. So I'm going to break it down by application ID. Um, and sure enough, I see that actually a majority of that traffic is coming from just one customer here. Um, now, oh, we can continue to go this further, but the, the idea here is that uh, having these dimensions, being able to break them down, now we're starting to ask like real questions that maybe I might look up who that is and go email them and say, what, what did you do this morning? Um, and sort of to get to this answer of like what, what is happening, what is going on in our API. Uh, so part of the trick is not just seeing the data out the end. It's also how do we get it in there in the first place. Um, there are, once again, are lots of different ways to do this. We actually use a whole bunch. We use everything from StatsD and Graphite, and we use Datadog. Um, but really, at the end of the day, the main core of a lot of this data is just basic logging, which is why I brought up that tail example before. Um, specifically, we do a couple things. Um, one is that we use a library called Structlog, uh, which is basically uh, not, instead of logging like print statements and text, we're just logging JSON. Um, which makes that data structured, uh, which means that you can now, instead of logging and needing to craft, carefully use your like F strings and stuff like that to get all the data in there, you set it up as a large JSON tree, uh, a, J a JSON blob, and you sort of push it to wherever we need to send it to. Uh, now, that being said, it, the keys that you use in that JSON blob uh, make a difference and are also sort of part of the art of getting sort of all of this right at the end of the day. Um, pulling into our code, actually, uh, one thing that we do, this is, this is actually the, the, at the WSGI level. I um, mean, the whole takeaway here, regardless of what all this code said, is that at the very end of every request, um, this is hooking into PyWSGI's log request method. Um, at the very end of each and every API request, we send exactly one log message. Um, and it's, it says, like, the event is called request handled, and we can just start stuffing data in here, including this additional context, which is a, another dictionary full of stuff. Um, this is a little bit of a different way to think about logging. Normally when you're, like, coding, you, like, get somewhere, you, like, print something, you want to log it as the code is executing to see what's going on. But when we're thinking about, thinking about an API, I only want exactly one log message for an entire request. So instead, I spend a lot of the time, like as the request is going from the start, as I'm collecting data, as I'm like authenticating, it's, I'm building up this giant dictionary. Uh, and I can, at the end of the day, in this case, this additional context thing. Um, and I can stuff all of those keys and values 
into this single giant request that comes out at the end. Um, so any error that comes up in the context of the request, any like extra metadata, like for example the application ID, uh, gets shoved into this one place, um, and then gets like logged at the end. To actually show you where some of that data enters, um, this is a f this is standard Flask's before request decorator. It's a good way to put like basic information that we need over the course of the request. So for example, here's this request environ log context. We're using Flask's environment system to basically start shoving data into this giant dictionary that I'm going to log once at the end. And here is that thing, is that field that I filtered by, endpoint. Um, this is a pretty standard one to have in a, in a log, um, but uh, it is this request environment variable over time, over the course of requests, gets stashed with all sorts of other useful things, uh, many of which I'll show in just a second. One of the big ones is the application ID, for example, which is how we figured out that all of these event updates were coming from one application. Um, and then finally, at the end of the day, now we have all of these different dimensions that we can break data down by. Now I can start to ask a better question about what is uh, actually happening in our system. Uh, the final piece of the puzzle here is that when I actually call this log.info here. Um, this really all struct log does is make sure it's a JSON blob and it right now writes it just to a file on disk. Um, and by disk I mean like any one of the hundreds of API servers that we have handling this. Um, and from there there's a service called uh, Honeytail which is Honeycomb's uh, file, file uh, log system. We actually have a lot of things looking at that file. We have also Elastic searches, FileBeat looks in there and sends it up, uh, sends it up to Really you can think of all of these little demons running on these boxes as like tail on crack. Um, and they, they are the ones who take care of like shoving all of this data up so we can deal with it. So I call log, writes a JSON blob to a file, uh, and then we finally get it up here on Honeycomb where I can break it down by all these different dimensions. Um, Honeycomb is a, is a nice tool in, uh, in my opinion, but there are like, like I said, this is, this is a space full of all sorts of different types of tools that are out there to help you try and visualize a lot of this data. Um, and we actually use a couple of them for, for different reasons. Uh, but to bring us sort of back to uh, this first question, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> um, the, really the, the answer to that starts to be helped by making sure both we're logging consistently. Just log once at the end of request, get all the data we need, think about the dimensions I want to start by looking things by, and start shoving them in along the way and visualize it kind of however you want. Like I said, like Honeycomb's a nice way to slice and dice it uh, in a very quick, uh, high dimensionality sort of way, but there are other tools for you as well. Uh, which sort of brings me to some additional questions that uh, we fairly frequently ask about our system. Uh, one of those is like, well, okay, so I, great, I see, I see that like things are happening, but how's that, how's that going? <laughs> is it, uh, and, the, and, and I mean that addressed to both our servers and to our users, most importantly our users. Um, and when it comes to an API product like ours, uh, at the end of the day, response time is really one of the more important things here. Like, are you giving me your email and contacts like quickly? <laughs> um, so response time is another something, is another thing that we uh, trace as well. When you have a lot of requests, you need to think about it in a couple different ways. So I'm actually going to break this down by endpoint. I'm going to use a heat map here for request time. Um, and then I'm going to just bound this a little bit so it, we can see what's going on here. Um, and this is this heat map here of visualizing request time. Um, so specifically, this is something, this is another field that we can uh, shove in here and request time comes from this, well, time.finish minus time.start. Uh, in, in, uh, in seconds here. And we're doing this at the uh, inside of the whiskey handler to really make sure that it's like we catch as much as we possibly can when it enters Python and then leaves Python again. Um, so the idea of request time is fairly straightforward, uh, but the question is how do you like think about it? Uh, because you can see like it, it, it varies quite a bit and it varies pretty dramatically by endpoint. One of the most important things that we look at is called P90. Um, basically, for, for those of you unfamiliar, it's a fairly standardish way to think about like distributions like this, but it means that in the case of this event lookup, 90% of the time it is 51 milliseconds or faster. 
Um, so it's sort of getting at not the worst case, but like a pretty bad-ish case, because uh, that's really at the end of the day what users remember. So P90 is the one that we really look at. Um, but it's also additionally useful to know your average, aka P50. And so in some of your worst cases, your outliers and things like that. So this heat map is actually a pretty cool way to visualize the spread of different request times that we have. And the color here is like the frequency, the intensity of it at the volume at which it's coming in. Um, so actually, to give, an, uh, to give another example of that, so we can pull this out for the past 48 hours, look a little bit further. Um, and we can actually show some very strong contrasts. For example, uh, here, the, like when you're looking up an event or when you're looking up an account, you, you can see it's like, it's all, it all takes about the same amount of time. There's not a wide variation between your average response time at like 44 milliseconds and your worst case scenario at 100 milliseconds here. Um, but there are some endpoints. So for example, endpoint contains uh, upload uh, that has a much wider spread and you can very much, this is the same y-axis here, and you can very, very much see that in here. Um, in this case, that's, that's very much expected. This is people uploading files. So we expect the distribution of the size of the files, the amount of time that it takes to be very different. Uh, but once again, this is sort of demonstrating how the visualization technique here very quickly and easily can start to tell you that type of information about your response times, about like how, how is the experience happening for people in aggregate over a large, over a large sample set. Um, we, we also can then use this to subsequently set up alerts on top of this and uh, if anything goes awry, but it's very helpful to sort of start to see uh, how that distribution is changing um, and really answer this question of, well, how is it, how is it going for you? Um, and here, uh, to sort of wrap that up, like we're really just, at the end of the day, time to start to end is the basic input for response time. Um, and then using things like a heat map and looking at P90 metrics can help give a, a numerical way to address that ongoing. Um, the next sort of pieces are, are integrated together, which is uh, part of this experience piece is, well, not just as it slows, it's just like working at all. Um, in, the, in, in the world of APIs, really at the end of the day, that question is, uh, am I getting any 500 errors? Uh, so the other way we can look at that here is I'm gonna break this down by HTTP status and ask again, are the requests coming through appropriately, like by request status here? I don't need it by endpoint either. Um, hopefully, I mean, we expect to see pretty much everything be at 200 requests, and in fact that it is. Um, to within our 99.9% .9 current like requirement of that. Um, so this is the sort of thing where uh, we really wanna, this is, like, this is like the most classic thing when thinking about APIs to really want to alert on, to have status pages about, to have like ongoing graphs and things like that for. Um, the alerting infrastructure for this, once again, this is a whole separate topic about like alerting systems that I won't go into now. Um, but it's, we, we actually use a variety of different tools on top of that. Um, specifically, we've been using uh, like Graphite, we use Sensor, we use PagerDuty to notify us when things are going on. Um, but one thing I wanted to uh, mention about that is that the, the, I mean, there are lots of different ways to keep track of that, but um, being able to have the, like, being able to have the data there, being able to know about it quickly is very important to be able to watch if any of these statuses are changing in any significant ways over time. Um, and sort of the, the final piece about <laughs> is it working is if it's not, then why is it broken? Um, sort of the final big question that we all always wanna ask. And um, in that context, we do a couple things for this. So one is that we record the error message uh, with the request as well. well. Let me do this. If HTTP uh, status is greater than or equal to 500, um, this will look bad. But remember, this is like a very small percentage of everything happening here. And we do have some. Um, and here we actually have like the errors to look at here. So something about timeouts, something about MySQL, we'll have to look into those later. Um, but in addition to that, not only having the error message, but then also having the error uh, tracebacks as well to get all the way down to the line of code. Um, one actually thing to reference here, I believe, yeah. So 
it is actually very important. Our, the way we get these error messages is we, if anything, anywhere in the request throws an exception, we catch it, we grab the sysx info, we pull out the tracebacks and shove it into the same context and send it away as well. Um, however, sometimes you get error messages like this. See how they like vary at the end? This is actually an, a bug that I need to fix. Uh, it is possible that there are like 100,000 of those lines. So it's difficult to get the frequency right to make sure, like it might be under, and it might be under reporting. So not only is picking the dimensions right, it's also making sure that what you're shoving in there actually is something that you can aggregate by. Um, and this is actually an example of an active bug that uh, is probably masking what might be a bigger problem. Uh, once again, there, when the case of air reporting, there are also a large set of tools that are used out there to do this. We actually, in addition to this, use Sentry to keep track of a lot of our air tracebacks and aggregate. Um, but sort of here is yet another way, the fact that we can sort of all shove it through the same, uh, into this, out the same JSON blob, into all these different pipelines, means that we can look at it from a bunch of different dimensions. Um, and actually the one major, the one last thing I want to talk about error messages that's important uh, is that a tool like Honeycomb is explicitly designed for aggregating and quickly visualizing a lot of data. As a result, this data is sampled. Uh, specifically right now it's sampled about 10 to 1. Um, and that lets, the perform that lets us keep a longer set of data. It basically is like you get so many gigabytes and it like cut, drops off after some amount of time. So if we sample it 10 to 1, we can see 10 days out instead of one day out. Um, but that's fine because if you've seen here, I've always been asking all of these aggregate statistics about data. But in the case of errors, it is very much the case that sometimes a customer will ask us about a particular single API request that went awry that they want investigated. Um, and that is something that does not come up here because the data is sampled. So uh, in sort of this theme of there is no omni tool or silver bullet for everything, we actually, in addition to this, use the elastic stack um, to be our sort of final end all truth as well. So in addition to getting those logs and sending them to Honeycomb, we also send them uh, to our own elastic clusters um, via elastic uh, service called FileBeat. Um, and basically we can use their search tools, specifically their Kibana interface, to go down and find that exact log line out of the past like couple billion that might have the, the particular and precise thing that, uh, that we need from there. Um, once again, as you can see, Elastic Kibana actually does have very powerful visualization tools uh, themselves. Um, it's, it's, not, it's more designed for building, uh, like they, they have a lot of sophisticated systems, but it comes at the expense of sort of the ease and quick UI that sort of Honeycomb has. So a lot of these tools you'll see overlap. Um, we found that they've had different strengths and as a result deploy quite a few of them uh, in the pursuit of answering all of these questions uh, that we have here. Uh, so, to, so to wrap this up, there are, uh, th these are just sort of four very high level classes of questions that I thought, I feel like I ask pretty, pretty often here. Uh, but when you pull together a lot of these different tools and a lot of the different like platforms together, you can start to get a pretty good answer um, at them. And I would say a couple of the, the takeaways in addition to that is one, making sure that we're, that we're logging things once, we have the right dimensions that are there, being able to have an interface that lets you play with them and slice and dice them quickly, um, and then being able to use that data in a flexible enough way to monitor it, to alert on it, um, and to keep everything uh, and to keep all the data that you're there in case you need to really slice it down into an individual way. Um, so yeah, so at the end of the day, this is what we, what we use to answer this question of finally of what are you doing? So I hope that uh, can help uh, your own observability issues going forward as well as you scale too. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I believe we also have about five minutes for questions. Yes. So how much time do you spend worrying about the fact that like everyone on your team is adding keys to that structured log dictionary that are sort of meaningful to everyone else on the team? Yeah, that <laughs> that is a that is a constant struggle, is the short of it. Um, we uh, 
there's another talk about or how I stopped worrying about keys getting added to my dictionaries. Um, one, of the, one of the things that helps that is the ability to, like there are just a lot of keys. Um, so much so that you really couldn't, like we've tried to keep like a very precise schema, but it does get a little bit out of, out of control. I mean one, there are some things that we can let float there. There's a bunch of one-off keys in here. But a good example is we really try to consolidate error logging. So instead of having error, error message, error msg, error underscore m, like it all got consolidated to like the same three fields. So in a couple of the critical cases, yes, we went through the effort to like keep track of that. Um, but it, it is the case that uh, you don't really want to think about it as like a rigid schema or as like precise dimensions you want to have, uh, which is actually a huge advantage of this tool because it has that sort of searchy interface. There are definitely other tools that expect you to send it exactly like eight dimensions and it does some like eight dimensionality thing for it and if someone shoves another key in there and makes a typo, you've kind of like lost that. Um, we definitely bias on the side of making it easy to more dynamically add and remove keys as necessary. Yes? I'm curious Yeah, we, um, well in terms of our, the API servers themselves, we uh, actually just bundle it up. Uh, we use, yeah, we just use Genicorn, and we use uh, like Greenlets, so we ship it up in a Debian package uh, and pretty much just unzip it on the servers. Uh, it's actually a pretty st intentionally straightforward uh, way to deal with that to allow the flexibility of being able to sort of get in and stop code or inspect it as it's going. Um, we, it is a like, it, through, through great effort, is a simple enough system to be very easy to spread across hundreds of different servers, very easy to not require large numbers of extra containers in between. Um, yeah, so the Flask pieces are by, by design as straightforward as we can. Now there are, we use OmniProxy to load balance in front of that as well. Each box are large EC2 boxes that run uh, several dozens of processes a piece uh, that can sort of uh, that all talk to a bunch of different databases, but um, the code itself, that flask part you saw, like that wasn't the entire before request handler for the entire API. Like um, there was, there's also several layers of blueprints on top of that to sort of break apart all the different endpoints. Um, but yeah, the deployment system is pretty is pretty straightforward. You say nihilist deploy commit and it goes. Yes. Uh, have you guys hit any limits of Honeycomb, or are there other features that you think Honeycomb is not great for? Doing this type of stuff? Um, yeah, well, I mean, the big one is that you, you can, the, at the way we use it, because we heavily sample, um, it's not good for finding that exact one <laughs> request. Uh, it's also not good for permanent data storage. So to, at our, our current API load, at the current amount we're spending for storage, we keep about like a week and change of, of data that's like quickly accessible. They've actually very recently added like slightly slower query, but deeper storage optimizations on top of that as well. Um, so you need wait like seconds instead of milliseconds. It's still actually pretty good. Uh, but our elastic elastic pieces, we just keep throwing raw uh, databases and S3 buckets at it. So we have a much longer storage system for that. Yeah. Yeah. You can do pretty much whatever you're doing with Honeycomb with Kibana. Anyway, you're using the Kibana. So what's the main advantage of using Honeycomb? Um, a lot of it is just the speed. The oh yeah, sorry. The question was, um, yeah, the, basically why uh, Honeycomb over Kibana. Um, I personally have found the the speed with which you can start slicing and exploring data in Honeycomb is very is like much better compared to Kibana. Um, really, at the end of the day, the hardest piece about using about any system is kind of getting here and asking like what. What do I want to break this down by? Uh, I actually had it rehearsed that it was application ID, but I might have tried like three or four different ways to break this down before I found the dimension that's like, oh, this is like, this is not an account issue, this is like an app level issue, for example. Um, and Kibana's interface is very much like, you need to know exactly which three axes you want, and you need to know exactly like, do I want to see this as a line chart? Is this a scatter plot? Is this like a pie thing? Um, so like that cognitive load is, is actually pretty tough when you're really just trying to explore across a bunch of dimensions very quickly. 
um, and the ability to sort of rapidly try out and a bunch of different ways to break it down and have a lot of them not work is a very valuable tool when sort of poking around and seeing like where this spike come from, like what's what's the commonality here in this data? Yes. Yeah. The or... Yes. So the question was about anonymization. Um, yes, particularly with email data, this is an extremely important and sensitive issue to us. We have a lot of uh, PII, just uh, like pr privacy and information filters, at a bunch of different stages um, throughout our system to make sure that no like email addresses, no tokens, no like anything like that leave our servers and touch even a file, let alone the logs. Um, but yes, this is this is like a we we have not done within. I mean, our engineering team is currently twenty people. So when, within that, we have not done a lot of individual permission around that. And I also, I've not actually not explored if that's uh, easily doable in any of these tools. But um, but yeah, part of this security is just sort of one making sure the data, uh, the sen more sensitive data doesn't get there in the first place. Um, and yeah, at a certain level, also just like trusting and carefully vetting the vendors that we send a lot of this data to. Yeah. Time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, where do you see yourself in the, in the competitive landscape with companies like Datadog, SimilarLogic, and Resolve? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, so for the, the question is where do we see sort of ourselves and these tools in the competitive landscape? So first of all, Nihilus as a company is not, like we're not an observability company. We, we see ourselves, um, we're, we're in competition, we, we sort of are an infrastructure for email, right? Like what Stripe does for credit cards, what Twilio does for SMS, we're the equivalent for mail contacts and calendar and IMAP and exchange and all that stuff. Um, the, the space of tools like Honeycomb and Kibana and Heroku and Datadog is a very competitive one. Um, I mean, I have like my own personal preferences and tools that we've liked. We've definitely also tried a bunch of them. Um, and I would say a theme of this is that we uh, actually all seem to have like pretty different strengths. We've not found the one tool to rule them all. Um, I, I use this as the example here because it was quick and easy to slice down uh, data like this in a, in a live demo context, but like we also use Datadog for like a lot of our server monitor or server fleet monitoring, for example. Like I was saying, we use Elasticsearch for the sort of deep log dive. We use like Graphite for a couple of our basic alerts that we do, especially anything that's like has a lot of, like anything that StatsD is really good for, just like sending really a lot of data um, for here as well. Um, so they definitely all have a little bit of their uh, of their trade-offs, but yes, it's a, they, they, there's a lot of overlap in the, in the observability space for sure. Um, well, great, I'll be around also to answer questions, but thank you all very much for coming.